you for the opportunity to share some of our research. As the title of this conference suggests, Russia and China, the architects of a new global order, leaders in Moscow and Beijing want to transform the unipolar form of global governance, advocated by some in this country, into a multipolar model where Russia and China, along with some other countries, would help to construct a new global security structure. A good test case for this new global architecture might be the situation around North Korea, particularly since both countries border the Hermit Kingdom and have played and continue to play significant roles in North Korea's development and direction. For the purposes of our presentation, Captain Young Jun Kim and I will briefly examine how the current Russian and Chinese leaders look at North Korea, and specifically how they regard the young and relatively new North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Their actions vis-a-vis -vis North Korea may be indicative of the blueprint of this new global security structure. Here's a brief roadmap of our presentation. Captain Kim will provide a thumbnail sketch of the North Korean leader and how the Chinese look at him. I will look at how Russia looks at North Korea, and together we will review our conclusions. Uh, as you see, here's uh, Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un was born in 1983 or 1984 and became the supreme leader of North Korea in 2011 December. So he is only 29 or 30 today. And um, he is the son of Kim Jong-il and the grandson of the Kim Il-sung, who is a founder of North Korea. Uh, he was not expected to be heir apparent as an official successor. But his older brothers were being unfit for a variety of religions. But there were in a lot of inside the ruthless family politics, and um, this helped Kim Jong-un uh, achieve his leadership position. This is important. He must operate within this kind of family system and family politics, just like Han system. Important because, as I said earlier, Kim Jong Un must operate within this kind of domestic family politics as well as international factor. So Kim Jong Un's leadership style is similar to his grandfather. Look at him; uh, that is similar to the, his grandfather, and um, his image of appearance and demand the North Korean people of their most dear and loving leader. Indeed, he has a adopted many of the mannerism and styles of his grandfather Kim Il-sung. North Korean autonomy, Kim Jong-un has been trying to follow two contradictory policies, uh, placing top priority to military defense while initiating economic and cultural reform. He wants to have a nuclear weapons and ballistic missile, at the same time he entertaining Google executive and Dennis Rodman and the player. Kim Jong-un needs an enemy for domestic regions to strengthen his leadership image and remove any potential political rivals, including his older brother. Kim Jong-un has to demonstrate the leader of not only against his enemies, the US, Japan, and South Korea, but also against the potential intervention in China, because of his father, Kim Jong-il's final world one, China is historically the greatest challenge North Korea. There are fears within the Himal Kingdom that China will transform North Korea into a Chinese colony. Having just a stronger leadership position, it may be too early to get an accurate perspective of the new Chinese leader Xi Jinping toward Kim Jong Un. Kim said greeting to congratulations Kim on his selection as the president of the People's Republic of China. While they have met not yet formally met, Xi Jinping likely views Kim Jong-un as a useful, though somewhat dangerous tool. China is like what they perceive as a <coughs> containment strategy by the government, as the U.S. government. 
China believed that the U.S. is trying to encircle them with their allies in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and to the Philippines, India, and Afghanistan. So historically, China has hidden its muscle and emphasized global harmony become, and people becoming a real power. China doesn't want any conflict with the U.S., which would harm their continued economic development. In this context, North Korea could be easily abandoned by China. However, they will not give it, it up for free. We will leave some of the implications of this approach in this conclusion. Now let's take a look at the Russian perspective. In July 2000, not long after he was elected Russian president, Putin visited North Korea, the first ever visit by a Russian leader. In the upper picture, you see him chatting with the former North Korean leader, Kim Jong-il. Many interpreted this visit as a sign that Putin was intent upon reestablishing Russia's prestige abroad and its sphere of influence in the East. Russia had largely spurned North Korea in the 90s, adopting a pro-West foreign policy. By visiting, quote, rogue North Korea, Putin was demonstrating an independent foreign policy. Some speculated that the visit was part of Putin's campaign against controversial U.S. missile defense plans. If Putin's intent was to convince the North Koreans to abandon their ballistic missile and nuclear programs, which were a major pretext for the BMD plan, then he surely failed. But in another sense, the trip was a success. From Russia's perspective, and especially Putin's, it is much better to have a stable, friendly, though perhaps dictatorial neighbor than one that is unstable, unfriendly, and perhaps democratic. After Putin's visit, the dear Korean leader made a number of trips to Russia and various trade and cultural deals were signed. The dear leader also ensured that Russia was included on what became known as the Six-Party Talk, designed to settle problems on the Korean Peninsula. The legacy of both the Cold and Korean Wars continues to shape how Putin views North Korea. For some 40 years, the USSR was something of a stepfather to the North Korean regime. While no longer an overt sponsor of the leadership in Pyongyang, Putin's Russia continues to provide minimal diplomatic and military support to North Korea. Putin does not believe that North Korea is part of any axis of evil. For instance, in 2011, the picture below shows Medvedev, then president, meeting with the North Korean leader to discuss joint military exercises. A year later, Russia would forgive nearly $10 billion in debt relief to the North Korean government and promise to invest nearly a billion in energy, education, and health care projects. Putin has not yet met the North Korean leader. There were unfounded rumors that North Korea might get an invitation to the apex summit held in Vladivostok in September 2012. But other than a couple thousand semi-illegal North Korean workers helping to get the city ready, there was no official delegation from Pyongyang. This image reflects some of the common Russian perceptions toward North, toward North Korea today. Recall that Russia shares the 12-mile border with North Korea, and this proximity is cause for some concern. Besides North Korea's WMD program, which can malfunction or lead to hostility, Russia fears an influx of refugees should the situation grow dire. Given their proximity and decent relations, the Kremlin is in a much better position to monitor the situation in North Korea. Over the past decade, when some in the West were predicting the imminent collapse of North Korea, the Russian assessment has been much more sanguine. The Russians consider China as the chief patron of North Korea, while they see the U.S. playing a similar role in South Korea. Also notice that Japan and NATO are actors in the Russian view. This notion that the U.S. and China are using the division in Korea to their advantage is widespread within Russia. In a geopolitical sense, Putin like Stalin before him, probably wouldn't mind if the Chinese and the Americans begin to fight over Korea, as long as some status quo is maintained. Russia wants to maintain good relations with both Korea. The chief political benefit may stem from comparison. Russia's mild authoritarianism looks pretty good compared to the repression in North Korea. Similar to the rhetoric coming out of Pyongyang and Beijing, the U.S. presence in South Korea also feeds into a prevalent belief within some in the Kremlin that Russia is again being surrounded by enemies. To a lesser degree, Putin and Kim use the same threat of foreign invasion to help legitimate their non-democratic form of government. I don't want to overstate Russia's anxiety regarding the fear of outside intervention, but some of their support of the North 
Korea stem from this fear. Russia has mostly a pragmatic view toward the situation in Korea. They don't want the North Korean leadership to be overthrown from outside, primarily because of the spread of instability, but also because of the dangerous precedent. They would prefer an evolutionary approach whereby Russia would work with China, the US, and other countries and help bring about peaceful change. <coughs> Putin does not, want nuclear, does not want North Korea to have nuclear weapons, but believes that dialogue is the best means to reach this goal. OK. Uh, what can we discern from this brief examination of Russia, Chinese, North Korean relations vis-a-vis -vis this new global security architecture? In building their multipolar model of global security, Russia and China will use North Korea to help dismantle the unipolar version, where the U.S. plays the role of, quote, global policemen. Yes, there are dangers, inconsistencies, and contradictions involved in this process, but this is Russia's and China's primary strategic objective. They want a model where major powers work together. Therefore, we propose that Putin and the Chinese leader look at the North Korean leader as a useful, though dangerous tool. So uh, both Russia and China view North Korea as a effective buffer between their countries and the US. Either country would want a unified Korea where American forces would locate on their very border. Both Beijing and Moscow will try to use this situation in North Korea to their advantage, using the chess analogy, while North Korea is not a proxy for either country. Russia and China understand that Pyongyang's anger is directed against South Korea, Japan, <coughs> and especially in the United States. And they will use it appropriately. China is not about to give up its influence over North Korea without receiving something in return, such as Tibet issue, Taiwan, or territorial dispute with Japan. Similarly, as the U.S. begins to pivot toward Asia, Russia and China will try to take advantage of the situation in North Korea to stymie U.S. efforts to strengthen its position. Both Russia and China look <coughs> good in comparison to North Korea, and therefore they have a vested interest in keeping the status quo. Both countries, China to a much greater degree, hope to reap economic awards by working with North Korea. So some of them using the Chinese expression chicken lips and um, cold tears. So both China and Russia consider their relationship with North Korea as something like chicken lip, where although it is not very valuable, they are reluctant to share with its enemies. Another Chinese expression is also chicken lips and Called the tears. So both Russia and China believe that they can use these lips to protect against the cold west wind. To conclude, the leadership in Russia and China do not subscribe to the unipolar model of global governance. They will likely use the tension on the Korean Peninsula to impress upon leaders in Washington that a multipolar security model of global governance is more effective. Thank you for your time. Very good.